Hello everyone and welcome to another Left Book Club event. This is the first LBC event in our Radical May series of the Radical Publishers Alliance, an online festival of books, discussion and ideas to change the world. This year to celebrate 150 years of Rosa Luxemburg, we publish Rosa Luxemburg's Socialism or Barbarism for our subscribers. And so tonight we'll be discussing her life, politics and its relevance to revolutionary politics today, internationalism and feminism. We're very excited to have four incredible speakers all under one virtual roof. So we're all also very happy that you as listeners and viewers can join us tonight. Uh, my name is Elif and I work with the Left Book Club on political education and events and I will be chairing the discussion tonight. A little bit about the Left Book Club. The Left Book Club is a subscription book club and not-for-profit initiative. We seek to foster a spirit of collective learning and political education. We aim to create spaces and avenues where people can learn from each other and discuss radical ideas that inform actions and practical steps with the goal of supporting the struggles fighting for us all. Left Book Club events feature speakers such as Kate Mann, Grace Blakely, Kojo Karam, Lewis Gordon, Gargi Bhattacharya, Harsha Walia, Lola Olufemi, Dali Gabriel, and our discussions engage with a wide range of radical thought. And tonight, don't forget to ask your questions on the YouTube live stream chat, and we'll make sure um, our, our speakers answer as many as possible. If you would like to become a member of the club, please visit leftbookclub.com and click become a member. Alternatively, you can start by subscribing to our mailing list. The, li the links are in the description of the YouTube live stream you are watching right now. Uh, don't forget to follow us, the Left Book Club, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to keep up to date with our events, promotions, and also giveaways. We have some exciting ones this month. Um, while you're watching us, subscribe to our YouTube channel too, which is where we live stream all our events. Um, tonight is a special event uh, because, as I said, it's to celebrate 150 years of Rosa Luxemburg. We are delighted to feature a guest panel of amazing speakers, including Peter Huddis, Eric Blanc, Joanna Busuma, and Delad Dirig to discuss the legacy of Rosa Luxemburg, well, Rosa Luxemburg's thought and how we can apply it to our struggles today. Um, there'll be various perspectives discussed, as I mentioned, um, a little bit about our speakers. So Peter Huddis is a professor of humanities and philosophy at Oakton Community College and author of Marxist concept of the alternative to capitalism and Franz Fanon, philosopher of the barricades and has published in numerous journals on issues relating to Hegelian philosophy, Marxist theory, Latin American social movements and critical race theory. He co-edited The Power of Negativity, selected writings on the dialectic in Hegel and Marx and the Rosa Luxemburg reader, as well as the letters of Rosa Luxemburg. He currently serves as the general editor of The Complete Works of Luxembourg, a forthcoming 17 volume collection as part of his, he edited volume one of The Complete Works of Rosa Luxemburg. Um, he is a member of the International Marxist Humanist Organization. Eric Blanc is author of the books, Revolutionary Social Democracy, Working Class Politics Across the Russian Empire, 1882 to 1917 and Red State Revolt, The Teachers' is Strike Wave and Working Class Politics. Eric Blanc is an organizer in Democratic Socialists of America and a doctoral candidate at NYU Sociology. Dilad Dirik is a postdoctoral researcher and an activist with the Kurdish Women's Movement. She is the author of the forthcoming book, The Kurdish Women's Movement, Movement History, Theory and Practice. Joanna Busuma is a political scientist with a focus on history and international relations and works as head of UNIT Europe at Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung for almost eight years. She is fascinated by Rosa Luxemburg since her early childhood when she discovered the place of Rosa's life on her father's uh, on her father's hand in her home down, hometown Berlin. In 2019 and 2021, she coordinated the projects of are less about 100 years of revolution and the murdering of Mo Rosa Luxemburg and the celebration of 150 years of Rosa Luxemburg. And without further ado, because of course you have all come to hear our amazing speakers tonight, over to you, Peter. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Ella, and uh, thanks to Left Book Club for making this event possible. Uh, it's a good time to discuss Rosa Luxemburg because she's one of those figures who seems to come to life every time a new stage or a new expression of freedom movements occurs in the world. And certainly in the last year, we've experienced that. Uh, we certainly saw other experiences of this, of Luxembourg, for instance, being rediscovered by a generation in the late 1960s. People were looking for an alternative as the new left developed and grew and the anti-war movements emerged uh, towards uh, an alternative to the social democracy versus Stalinist alternative that seemed to predominate in that era. Um, we saw it uh, years later when the feminist movement came on the scene and also awakened a new level of interest in Luxembourg on a level that posed questions about Luxembourg that maybe hadn't been asked, asked before, but were being asked now, or that is in the 80s, uh, with the lens of feminism to look back on Luxembourg. And so you began to have this discussion of the feminist dimension of Luxembourg and how she relates to the questions of women's emancipation more directly than we saw in earlier periods of her life. Um, works of people like Dunievskaya, Frigga Haug, and Jacqueline Rose, for instance, who uh, kind of reclaim that kind of feminist dimension of Luxembourg. Um, and I think that with every generation, we see new questions asked about her work, depending on the questions that people bring to her work based on the realities that they're faced with. Um, and I think we're seeing that another version of that today. Um, it's quite interesting to me that in the last several years, but especially the last year, uh, given that we have experienced in the United States, at least, the most important continuous series of mass protests and the largest series of protests in US history uh, in response to the killing of George Floyd, of course, the movement for black lives and movements against police abuse, is for Rosa Luxemburg to now, now be discussed by many in a context that we had not heard her taken up very much before in terms of issues of critical race theory, issues of post-colonial theory, uh, where she tended to be a very marginalized figure in many of the discussions that were occurring um, uh, previously. Uh, so it's exciting to come across, for instance, uh, people like uh, Jackie Wang, carceral capitalism, who takes up our theory of uh, accumulation of capital to theorize uh, some of the logic that drives uh, contemporary capitalism uh, and um, uh, the persistence of forms of so-called primitive accumulation of capital that continue to exist in modern advanced capitalist societies. Uh, we have people like Robin Kelly, who's kind of rediscovered her work and trying to think out uh, her critiques of various authoritarian tendencies in socialism in relationship to uh, the history of third world liberation struggles and the problems that they ran into in terms of hierarchical structures uh, in the last several decades. So, I, it's, so it's a very interesting period in which to be uh, renewing a discussion of Luxembourg and looking at her in light of some of these questions, even though she didn't write directly very much at all on race, uh, but she did write a lot on the relationship between capitalism and imperialism and the integrality of the two. And that is gaining a considerable amount of re-examination as, as most especially seeing the new book that's just about to come off the press, maybe it's even shown up in some people's hands, Creolizing Rosa Luxemburg, contributions from several different people looking at Luxembourg in light of some of these questions. The thing I just want to focus on just briefly is to me the most important contribution that we can gain from Luxembourg uh, through a critical reading, because it has to be a critical reading because she can't answer the questions of our time. I mean, that goes without saying. We're living in a very different period than hers, but her approach to the problems of her time can aid our approach to the very different kinds of problems we're facing in our time. Um, in many respects. And I think the fundamental question we're facing in our time is what is the alternative to capitalism? What does it actually mean? Now it's very welcome and we're very exciting and great that we've had this kind of resurgence of interest in socialism sweeping much of the Western world and many other parts of non-Western world in the last several years. But you know, very rarely do we actually get to discuss or really hear a lot of investigation about what do we mean by socialism itself? as if the question is only a strategic or tactical question of how best to organize to reach that goal. But what does socialism mean? The idea of socialism is in profound crisis in the 21st century. Um, and the excitement of people trying to getting involved, young people especially that I see all around me, who are being awakened anew to this idea of socialism, but what it actually means, is it simply redistribution of surplus value? Is it simply nationalization of property? Is it public 
public control rather than private control of industry? Does that really produce an exit from capitalism? It's, it's certainly not what we saw socialism mean in the 20th century in state status regimes that call themselves by that name. So how does Luxembourg's work, especially her critique of her fellow socialists, especially her critique in a booklet, The Russian Revolution of 1918, where she took to task some of her close colleagues in the Russian Marxist movement for suppressing democracy after the seizure of power. What does that have to tell us about rethinking what socialism means for the 21st century? I think that's really the place where some of Luxembourg's most important insights can be drawn from, even though she was living in an era where she was burdened as all the Marxists of the time were burdened by a grave limitation. And that was by thinking of the fundamental social contradiction being market anarchy, that is capitalism, versus planned production, i.e. socialism. We now know in the 21st century that that's not a viable framework to think about the emancipatory project of a new society. But you can certainly have planned production within the framework of capitalism, and capitalism has learned to plan in many respects and simply can't be reduced to simple uh, a question of organizing exchange as the alternative to it. So I think that there's, despite the fact that Luxembourg is, is apart from us in a different era in many respects, by not um, uh, having experienced Stalinism, not having seen the transformation of socialist revolutions completely into their opposite, her humanist approach, I think, can give us a lot of ammunition to think through these questions for our own, for our own time. Thank you very much for that, Peter. Um, yeah, without further ado, uh, Joanna. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. I will point out some of those things and Peter was already tackling a little bit from a different perspective than uh, Peter did because um, I'm coming from Germany, from a country with a divided history also in a, in a post-socialist situation. And when we were thinking about how to write and speak about Rosa Luxemburg 150 years after her death and 102 years after her murdering, we also wanted to dismantle her like for many projections which were done like in the last 100 years on her life and her writings. And um, I will focus on, on four uh, little things, I guess, uh, which are worth um, a why to read uh, Rosa Luxemburg's work today. The first thing um, is um, her work on, on revolution or reform, which is still very valid in the moment. There was the famous Bernstein debate. She was in a large discussion uh, about the situation of the German social democracy during the First World War. And um, she never hesitated um, to go into a conflict situa um, situation to fight for what she, what she was thinking about, even though she lost a lot of friends on her way. So a lot of the social democratic men were helping her in the beginning of her political career. But Rosa Luxemburg thought that there could uh, be no change, like a fundamental change without a revolution. And I guess if we if we look on, on the situation today and we see like large movements like Fridays for Futures movements or feminist movements, and we see um, governments being in a situation of struggling with representation of the democracy at all, I guess it's it's very much worse to go, to go back to um, Rosa Luxemburg's writing and see how she um, saw the, 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 the tension which is necessary to come to a um, to a profound political change. A second point, um, um, I guess why it's still worse um, to read Rosa Luxemburg's work is, and also to, to have a little look on her life is um, her idea about emancipation and lifelong learning. For Rosa Luxemburg, um, the idea was that you go like through a lot of situations where you adapt new things and um, you take them for lifelong learning. And she was a teacher in a in a school for workers for a very long time. So she was not only writing about this, her idea of emancipation, which is also very important for her understanding of socialism. I will uh, come to that a little bit later. And um, so she also was living that kind of emancipatory thinking and um, going on in her lifelong working. And she was not only interested in politics and a political writer and the political activists within her parties, she was also very much interested in 
in other signs. So she did a, when she was in prison, she was imprisoned in the late uh, period of her life um, uh, for many years. And um, she did a herbarium, we, we published that um, from the Stiftung where she was, where, where she was going very deep into the, into the science of plants and so on. So for her, the decisions she made in her life and her political work were always like um, very close to each other. Important as well when we think about the, how to overcome capitalism or what could be, um, what could be if we overcome capitalism. Her idea of socialism, I guess, is still very valid. So what Peter said is, of course, absolutely right that she had the idea without seeing Stalinism in her work on, on the Russian Revolution. She was already very much in fear, and she tackled that very clear. You know that there could be like a. Uh, like like a like a heterogeneous thinking, you know how so socialism could be brought into um, the countries, which had become truth afterwards and afterwards and made uh, the the history of socialism, as we all know, for a very long time, very um, complicated. And um, the last point, I guess, um, which is very interesting and important, is Rosa Luxemburg. Seeing Rosa Luxemburg as a person. So we will discuss later a little bit um, the, the big question which um, we all, all scientists who work on her always tackle, was she a feminist or was, was she not a feminist? I guess um, herself she would have said, said I'm not, but of course her best friend Clara Zetkin was the most important figure of, um, of uh, uh, socialist feminism at her time. It would not probably not have existed and since those both spent many years like in a very, very close um, friendship. We know that Rosa Luxemburg must have, um, have uh, spent a lot of thinking about her role as a woman. But she also uh, lived a life um, which, was, um, uh, which was very unnormal un, um, for the time uh, when she was there. So she decided to leave um, her home country, Poland, where she already experienced the programs when she was 17 to be one of the first persons studying, first women studying at all in Europe at the University of Zurich, where it, um, uh, where, which was the only place where it was possible. She was, um, she was a small person speaking in many languages very fluently, but she always took new decisions. When she came to Berlin in the end of um, the 19th century, she, she immediately decided to go into politics. So she made the decision against, uh, you know, just being an educated woman and maybe just joining the salons, you know, of the uh, of the late Kaiserreich um, and or going into it. So she went into the social democracy and she she was doing her fighting there. And I guess um, the last point um, why it's very much worse to. Um, read Rosa Luxemburg today is her letters, because she was not only a profound political thinker, uh, which uh, who makes us uh, think um, today about a lot of stuff, but she was also like, like a literature person. So her prison letters are sometimes like very poetic, not only her love letters, her descriptions of the surrounding in the prisons um, are an, an example of somebody who had like a unbelievable, beautiful perception of nature and her surrounding. And I guess all those points are still, and we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of still things to discover. There is still work to be done in translation of letters um, um, which she wrote in Polish, but there, there's also already like a, a large um, dimension of, um, of her writings, uh, which could be seen and used today from all those different views, from her life perspective, her perspective on socialism, on the alternatives of capitalism, on life as a learning person. Um, and that's uh, what I guess, uh, uh, which makes it worse to focus on her still. Thank you very much, Jonah and Eric. Yeah, um, first of all, I want to thank um, everyone for being on the panel and for Left Book Club for existing. Uh, I wish we actually had this in the United States, <laughs> maybe uh, on a more widespread scale. Um, it's fantastic. So to dive straight, in, to straight into it, I think it's fantastic we're talking about Rosa Luxemburg. Um, and 
to do her justice, we should treat her with the same level of critical thinking that she treated everything. And to me, that's one of the really inspiring aspects of Rosa Luxemburg. So even when you disagree with her, you could see that she was an organizer and a thinker who is constantly trying to um, reassess whether the current kind of prevailing wisdom on the left or in bourgeois politics was valid or not. So it's in that spirit, I think, that we should look honestly at both like her contributions and uh, some of her limita limitations. I want to argue a somewhat controversial uh, interpretation of some of this, which is that some of the most relevant aspects of Rosa Luxemburg's work are the least innovative. Um, and I, I want to jump into that a bit because there, there can be a tendency to romanticize Rosa Luxemburg in a way that I think she would have rejected and she certainly didn't uphold as a um, sort of approach to any other figures, um, and certainly not herself. And so coming with that, there can be a tendency to assume that certain aspects of her thinking um, were either not shared widely on the left at the time or are uh, sort of um, silver bullets for us today. And so I'm gonna start with what I think is some of the most relevant aspects of her political thinking. And then uh, insofar as we have time, just raise a few issues of like what might be less relevant, spark a little bit of debate. The first thing to say is, Sometimes the most central aspects of Rosa Luxemburg's political thinking can be uh, overlooked, which was that she was committed to class struggle. And, and so this, this is interesting because it's almost taken for granted, um, but we shouldn't take it for granted insofar as uh, an orientation towards centering the organized working class as an agent for, work, uh, for social change and fighting oppression from racial to gender to today climate um, disaster. That is no longer accepted um, sort of in the broad, uh, as accepted at least as it was a century ago. And if we were to look, if you look at what Rosa Luxemburg's politics on the ground, whether it was in Poland or I've studied or in Germany, the central thread tying it all together was uh, an orientation to polarizing society as much as possible between the working class and capitalists and trying to move on that contradiction in the direction um, of socialism. And that maybe for listeners might seem obvious, but it's not obvious today politically that that is still a viable approach. Um, and it's impossible actually to understand the rest of Rosa Luxemburg's politics without always coming back to that fundamental starting point. And insofar as she did that, that wasn't actually particularly original. Uh, that was shared broadly speaking by the left uh, in which she was embedded, which was at the time called itself revolutionary social democracy. This was like the left of the second international. Rosa Luxemburg was very much a product and one of the most brilliant expressions of that political current, which in Russia was uh, sort of most uh, famously articulated by her and Lenin and the Bolsheviks and also Rosa Luxemburg's party, the Polish social democracy. In Germany, she was a very close ally uh, for most of her political life with Karl Kotsky, the Pope of Marxism. And we need to situate her political thinking for almost the entirety of her political life within that sort of consensus. Um, and it's not to actually detract from her thinking, but it's to show how widespread many of the things that she was arguing were at the time. And I just would say, as far as the relevance of that for today, I think that the events of recent years have underscored the absolute centrality of class struggle and of in, specifically of building independent class organization for all of our fights. It's not a question of like whether economic exploitation is more important than race or gender. That's not the frame, that's not the debate. The question is what is the missing organizational political power link for us to win all of our demands today? And I think if Rosa Luxemburg around, she would say the key missing thing if we look at recent struggles across the board is that the working class is not organized enough yet to impose itself uh, on capital and to coalesce um, all of the oppressed sectors of society to win its demands. And I think we saw that in the defeat of Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn, in which were class focused, but not class rooted projects. And in our inability so far uh, to reverse the tide of neoliberalism and of looming climate disaster. So in some ways the big contribution of Rosa Luxemburg, something that probably any, if you take any socialist uh, of the left uh, in second international today, they'd be like, this is the thing you should do. And so I think we should uh, take her up on that. As far as her, you know, limitations, I think I want to point to two. 
One is on the question of Polish independence. And so this might seem a little bit obscure, but it's a huge deal because uh, Rose, people tend to focus on Rosa Luxemburg's writings in Germany, but she was, uh, you know, she was a Polish Jew. Um, and a lot of her leadership actually took place in the context of the Russian revolution in empire wide. In regards to the first point I made, I think we should again stress the positive aspects of this is where Rosa Luxemburg's party like the Bolsheviks was firmly oriented towards what they called working class hegemony, which the working class would lead the struggle for democracy and fight against Tsarism. And in fact, they did that and have played a central role in the October Revolution. And so there's a huge um, contribution there. The flip side is that in Poland itself, Rosa Luxemburg uh, was extremely committed to uh, opposition to Polish independence. And that played a hugely damaging role uh, on the development of one of the most important workers movements and national movements uh, in the whole world at the time. People really looked at Poland as sort of the central uh, fight for democracy in the 19th century. And it would also be looked at as the mechanism through which the Russian revolution would spread to Germany and elsewhere. So its defeat was a big deal. And Rosa Luxemburg herself and her party played a huge role in sort of the impasse of the Polish revolution insofar as that she didn't, uh, and they didn't support the fight for tying independence uh, to a class struggle approach. And I don't think that's actually because Rosa Luxemburg was like a class reductionist or um, anything along those lines. I would argue actually it's just, she was kind of sectarian uh, in the context of a Polish movement. And that is still relevant because there's a lot of sectarianism today in which people uh, for their own factional regions, uh, reasons sort of doubled down on their own position. And she spent you know most of her political life trying to fight other Marxists in the Polish movement who were in favor of independence. And so she actually was very much against oppression. She was very much against the oppression of Poles, but she could never bring herself around to adopting a position that basically like her factional enemies had articulated for a long time. And so again, for us, uh, it's important to not put uh, our independent political projects or um, ideas over the interests of the struggle as a whole. And I think that that was clearly shown in Rosa Luxemburg's case. Um, the last point I would make that's worth thinking through, and this is more contradictory, is the extent to which um, Rosa Luxemburg overgeneralized certain aspects of the experience of the revolutionary movement in Russia. And I wanna say that this is contradictory because as Peter mentioned, and this is hugely important, um, Rosa Luxemburg famously pushed back after 1917 against um, the tendency of Lenin and Trotsky and others to say, look, this is the new model for socialism uh, with its tendencies towards being anti-democratic, uh, its absence of universal suffrage, civil liberties and all of that. And so Rosa Luxemburg in that sense played a hugely important role for saying, look, you know, maybe what you're doing in Russia is uh, necessitated by events, but don't uh, make a virtue of necessity and certainly don't try to project that internationally. So that's a positive. The flip side, and this is underestimated today, is one of the reasons people come back to Rosa Luxemburg so much is that they see her, not necessarily wrongly, as projecting a focus on like spontaneity and mass action that she articulated as one of the main lessons in particular of the 1905 revolution in Russia. Rosa Luxemburg in many ways can be credited with something that Leninists later did, which was to really push back against the um, centrality of electoral politics uh, for winning socialism and capitalist democracies. And I think that's a questionable move on her part. She really did believe that the forms of like volcanic mass strikes erupting in uh, an autocratic state like Russia could be generalized in a political and capitalist democracies across the world. And I think for us, we still see this debate over and over again over the relative importance of social movements versus political parties. And I would just argue that I think the experience on the whole over the last century has really um, gives us real reason to doubt the idea that it's just gonna be through the ever increasing struggle from below that you're gonna to move towards socialism. And I think that some sort of combination of bottom up struggle with a serious strategic orientation towards uh, radically transforming, but working within the democratic capitalist state is the only viable way in the conditions of political democracy to build mass working class power. And so I would caution us to push back against this idea that I do think Rosa Luxemburg played an important role in projecting. So her legacy was messy. Uh, she wouldn't want us to romanticize her. And I think that her, on the whole, her contribution though, 
is extremely relevant in the same way that so many of the revolutionized social democrats were and that's why it's worth engaging with her as we struggle today thanks thank you so much for that eric um and dilla Thank you very much, Elif, and thanks everyone else. Um, I'm so excited to be on this panel to speak about the ongoing legacy of Rosa Luxemburg for, especially for the women's struggle today. And that's what I'm going to focus on. And I will start out by saying that uh, in Kurdistan, whether in the women's academies built in the context of the Rojava revolution or in, um, in schools at the Mahmoud refugee camp in Southern Kurdistan, Rosa Luxemburg, both her name and her picture is very much alive and for the Kurdish women's movement, but also for many other women's struggles today, she continues to be a symbol, uh, especially for women who insist that another life is possible, that the world that we have today is not the one that has to be there. And there are of course many people who continue to build alternatives in the here and now on a daily basis. So, um, I mean, I'm not a, an expert on the life of Rosa Luxemburg. Um, but uh, as uh, the other panelists are, but I will speak mostly about uh, her significance and many of the things that we can learn from her, especially with regards to uh, approaches to uh, reform or revolution in the context of the women's uh, struggle. Of course, as a woman, as a Jew in, the, in a time of rising anti-Semitism and fascism in Europe, as a defender of a socialism from below, as others have already pointed out, and also as somebody who really deeply feels with people's uh, suffering, who doesn't see socialism as a merely technical, mechanical, theoretical thing, but really as a moral question, as a firm believer uh, in the fact that good organization, ideological clarity and consciousness can really emancipate the masses of people from oppression. I think her life story and her struggles really uh, teach us a lot, even today in a time of social despair, femicide, equicide, and um, militarism, and many other things. As I said, I will focus on the women's struggle and what we can learn uh, from Rosa Luxemburg's insistence uh, that dominant systems that kill and exploit life simply cannot be uh, reformed, especially in light of new forms of fascism that we see today. That's one of the things that I would like to argue that um, insights into today's fascism are very crucial for the women's struggle today. And also I want to speak a little bit about the fact that increasingly we see uh, femicides being committed against politically active, politically struggling uh, women today. And what does that say uh, about the status of things today? Uh, so of course, even if degrees and contexts vary in different parts of the world with the help of education, religion, nationalism, militarism, and so on, male domination or patriarchy is one of the most normalized forms of oppression and violence today. And um, we see this, of course, on a world scale with uh, the way in which the economy is organized. We see it in how uh, patriarchy is reproduced in, in the media, militarism, the international division of labor, and the atomization of women through misogyny, through violence against women often means that women lack the tools to organize because they are atomized in these ways. And because patriarchy is so normalized, it's often hard to believe uh, that uh, the abolition of patriarchy is possible. I think it's Mark Fisher who in his book, Capitalist Realism talks about how um, it is easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine an end of capitalism. And I would argue that actually, it sometimes seems as if it's even more difficult for people to imagine an end of patriarchy because it is that uh, normalized. And I'll come to why I think that is the case. Uh, but because of all of these factors, it is often perceived, I mean, women's liberation is often perceived as a distant uh, utopia. And the best we can uh, imagine, the best thing we can have are reforms within state uh, laws. And even that is only reserved for a privileged uh, small group of people in particular countries. So in any way, in every sense of the way, a women's revolution is probably one of the most absurd things for people to think about, but there are uh, very many revolutionary movements committed to the idea and also people including, of course, the Kurdish women's movement is committed to an idea of women's liberation. But I would like to talk about this in a bit more detail, because I think when we think and speak about the women's revolution, two things are very important. One is a critique of liberal feminism, and two is a dissociation of the term revolution from these very patriarchal and state-centric ideas. And I think this is exactly where we can learn a lot from Rosa Luxemburg. Um, so, of course, uh, we know throughout history, 
women have often taken part in different struggles and social movements and revolutions, but often the so-called women's question, and it's almost a cliche to say this, uh, is often deferred to a time after the revolution, after uh, empire has been abolished, after the country has been liberated and so on. And this, of course, is important to analyze. These backlashes are very important to understand and, and critique. But they're often also turned into these defeatist tropes that also, again, normalize the idea that patriarchy isn't something that has been socially created and can be overcome because it's a system of oppression that is linked to other forms of oppression, but just a natural fact of life in that sense. But at the same time, in recent years, we've seen a rise of transnational, internationalist women's struggles um, that often link uh, these different issues together uh, and struggle against the normalization of sexism, against femicide, uh, and so on. And like I said, feminists have often been also at the forefront of struggles against capitalism, against war, and, and other things. And what we've seen in the last uh, couple of uh, years and decades is increasingly uh, words like you know, gender equality or feminism have entered the mainstream. Of course, on one hand, this is a good thing. Uh, it is important for gender equality, for the women's struggle to be discussed uh, more widely. But at the same time, it's really important to ask in a time in which this is what a feminist looks like is, for example, printed on t-shirts that were produced in sweatshops in the global south, for example, or when uh, questions around women's empowerment can even become occasions to justify wars and militarism in different parts of the world, especially in the Middle East, then we have to ask ourselves, what is this neoliberal feminism? Why is it compatible with the interests of, of capitalism and the state? And uh, who is uh, who is helped by it, really? And on whose terms are we talking about gender equality today? And um, just to give two very recent examples, I know I don't have that much time, but just a few days ago, I saw uh, an advertisement for the CIA in which a migrant woman of color is talking about uh, all of her struggles, uh, being a woman of color, being young, being a migrant, being somebody uh, who has a mental health condition and so on. And she's wearing the, the black revolutionary fist on her t-shirt. So, and this is, <laughs> this is an advertisement for the CIA. Uh, which is, of course, responsible for so many military coups, for fascistic dictatorships, especially in Central and South America. But what does this mean, really, when all of this language, when these struggles for which so many people have died, actually, uh, become part of uh, branding these institutions of, of power? What does it mean when we talk today about women's uh, empowerment? Um, as something that is that compatible with the system, can it be compatible with the system? And of course, the other uh, striking example is the fact that no one other than Hillary Clinton, for example, uh, which also we know a lot about her, has recently announced that she would uh, work on a TV show um, on Kurdish women fighters who have fought against the so-called Islamic State. And of course, we know that the, that Hillary Clinton is at the forefront of just of historically she has been and she continues to be uh, supportive of uh, a NATO country like Turkey, which is the second largest NATO country, and uh, drone uh, production intelligence that is being shared between Turkish and American uh, armies. So on one hand, there is, of course, the cooperation between Kurdish fighters in Syria with the US, but at the same time, um, the same country is responsible for the suppression of, of these alternatives that are being built there. So this is a whole other um, a box, a can of, a kind of worms. But what I'm trying to say here is that we see increasingly these attempts to depoliticize feminism, to change the meaning of revolutionary struggles. And um, this is very dangerous because we see at the same time that more and more women's movements are trying to fight against the depoliticization of the women's struggle, but they are at the same time attacked. So we see, of course, on a global scale, uh, a rise of femicide, but there's also a very particular type of femicide which targets uh, politically active women. So in the context of the Kurdish women's movement, Often when we speak about Rosa Luxemburg, we also uh, remember Sakine Jansis, for example, who's the co-founder of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, who was killed alongside Fidan Doan and Leila Shailemez in Paris almost one century um, later, also in January, uh, in a similar fashion as uh, Rosa Luxemburg. But there's also uh, women like Hevrin Khalaf, who was murdered by pro-Turkish mercenaries in, in northern Syria in 2019, Berta Caceres, Mariela Franco, Karima Baloch, these are all women um, who 
are revolutionaries, who are radical women, who have defended life, and because of their resistance against these systems of oppression, they are targeted. And when I say system, I'm talking about all of these political, economic, and cultural systems that tie systems of oppression together. So I want to just uh, come to a conclusion very soon. I know that I don't have that much time, but increasingly we see that there are new forms of fascism and they have very clear male dominated uh, characteristics. There's a, there's a connection between patriarchy and fascism that cannot be missed. And here it's important to remember that it was not just a very ugly, overt form of fascism that killed Rosa Luxemburg and people like Rosa Luxemburg. It is often also the inability uh, by people closer to the center to say no pasaran uh, to fascism when it's, when it's time. So it's often also the inability to organize or to give in more and more, to appease fascism more and more that kills people like uh, Rosa Luxemburg. And we see this today also on one hand, there's a mainstreaming of gender equality, but at the same time, politically active radical revolutionary women are killed uh, one by one. Uh, so what does this all mean today? I think it's important for us to understand when it comes to the women's struggle that fascism and capitalism, they're today entangled in very different surprising ways. They don't necessarily have to look uh, uh, very racist, sexist and xenophobic in the old sense. Today, they look more feminine. Sometimes they look different. They are entangled in these different ways. This is why political strategy and ideological clarity, I think, is very much uh, needed. So uh, this is why I guess what the Kurdish women's movement and others are often stressing is that the women's struggle can only succeed if it also becomes an autonomous, uh, an independent, um, uncompromising, and actually the revolutionary radical wing of wider uh, struggles for justice. And at the same time, all other forms of uh, or, or struggles against injustice also need to center the women's struggle as part of their agendas. The Women's Liberation Project cannot be an add on to the anti capitalist struggle. It has to be really a, a crucial part of it alongside the struggle against racism, against ecocide, and other things. And this is very important because I think these corporate feminisms that we see mushroom everywhere are also very anti ecological in their in their character. So I think thinking concretely, but also imaginatively about revolution from, from this perspective, uh, for thinking about the transformation of social relations also um, is very important. And I think this is where uh, the Kurdish women's movement, for example, but also many other women's movements who organize from the ground up, uh, really take women like Rosa Luxemburg as an example to really dissociate the idea of revolution from, from the state and to, to develop new alternative concepts, for example, a world women's democratic confederalism and so on. So I think uh, I'll stop here and just say that, you know, more than a hundred years ago, Rosa Luxemburg argued uh, when talking about the question of reform, reform or revolution, that we needed urgent answers when we, if we want to defeat this, uh, the barbarism of, of capitalism and, and choose socialism instead. I think today in a time in which femicide is on the rise, when we see uh, these new entanglements between different forms of oppression and where gender equality is really becoming a fashionable agenda of the system itself uh, and compatible with the state and neoliberalism and so on, uh, then it's time also for women's struggles to ask, do we want empowerment or do we want revolution? I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much for that, Dilar. Um, I mean, I think we've covered so much ground, uh, particularly in relation to how to discuss Rosa Luxemburg and her legacy. Uh, but I actually want to ask a question to all our speakers. And it, I think it kind of relates to, um, you know, what Dilar very briefly touched on to in terms of a transformation of social relations when we talk about uh, revolution. But I want to focus a bit more of it in an individual sense. Now, I think popularly when we talk about the way a leader or a thinker lives or the focus on their lives, it's, you know, often uh, either seen as or, or sometimes does kind of slip into personality cult territory. And I think there's, uh, for various historical reasons, there's a lot of discomfort around this. But I think as also some of the discussions we've seen today and some of the other discussions we've also had um, at Left Book Club events, it also, it also is quite dangerous, particularly in terms of the struggle we're meant to be uh, waging right now to have this you know, stark separation between political and private life. 
And so what I wanted to ask was, you know, when we're talking about uh, like politics and life and, and revolution, sometimes we see uh, whether it's a movement or a group or an environment that is politically left, but not morally left. And I mean that in terms of the social relations amongst movements or amongst uh, groups. So I guess what can Rosa Luxemburg teach us in terms of how also one can live uh, while talking, while trying to achieve revolution or also, or actually, um, well, and actually, how important is it in how we live while we're also fighting for revolution? Because I think this particularly comes into, um, comes into play when we talk about uh, women's question, women's revolution and feminism. We've seen many revolutionary leaders and thinkers, particularly male ones who actually haven't been very good on that, but of course are taken as great examples. So anyways, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be the commentary on this question, but yeah, I guess, can we learn from Rosa Luxemburg in terms of how one can live while fighting for revolution and is how we live um, in relation to our politics important? Um, and I know we're on Zoom, so just to not get confused, I guess, should we do it in the order of everyone spoke this time round? So Peter, do you wanna go first? Your, your comment reminds me of something that Luxembourg writes to Yogesh's, her comrade and lover, uh, where she says she's kind of sick and tired of reading the party press because even when she agrees with what's being said uh, by her colleagues or in the party press, she says it's just written with this stale kind of wooden, predictable kind of format. I want to say something great. I want to find a, a language to express uh, my feelings about what life is like in, in a way that I'm not hearing it from my comrades. And she's kind of appealing to Yogesh's to, you know, to do that too, <laughs> which doesn't work out so well. Uh, he wasn't much of a writer, though more was a writer, as it turns out, than we thought, because a trove of his letters has been found that long ago that we didn't know about. But in any case, I, I, I think of that when you make that statement, because she, she was had a very expansive vision, and, and I don't, she was looking for a mode to articulate uh, her vision that, um, I think she kind of was kind of searching for a mode of thinking that that um, that doesn't capitulate to the realism of of, uh, of, of the present, right? And um, that's what you get from her letters. That's what you get from a lot of the spirit of her life. Um, in terms of how it relates, though, in terms of the personal and the political being connected, you know, there's this fascinating thing that is it a coincidence that after some, I don't know, 15, 17 years of being in a relationship with Yogesh's, her lover and comrade, and worked so closely together in the Polish movement and elsewhere, that um, it's right shortly after the 1905 revolution and all of the growth that she goes through through her experience of it and writing on it, that uh, they separate, okay? Is that just an accident? Or is it that she felt that she had grown in a way that he didn't recognize or couldn't accept because she was not considered the organizational sort of person earlier, particularly. She left the Polish affairs organizationally largely to him, although she was, of course, writing the programs to a large degree. Uh, so there's something there about the personal and political too, right? About making leaps that your companion maybe is not willing to accept. But then there's also, uh, that she works with him after a very troubled, horrible breakup, very painful breakup. They work together for the next decade as a, in a comradely way, right? Uh, and he spends, you know, he devotes, he actually lost his life searching for her murderers, right? You know, is, they remain extremely close politically, even when they were dis, disengaged personally. So th there's a lot there in terms of Luxembourg's um, uh, reaching for the future, so to speak. She, she, I think, uh, would never quite felt completely comfortable in the framework in which the parties that she was in operated. But I have to agree, and I maybe take it a step further than what Eric said just very quickly, that when you look at her work inside the Polish party, which we're getting to have a better feel of now that with all these materials are being translated from the Polish, there you get a different impression. I mean, there you see the factionalism that was as bad as any factionalism in Lenin's party, right? Uh, and almost out competing them for it. So uh, again, she had this beautiful vision about her, but it's, it's the principles that mean something for today. It's not necessarily how these figures from the past, whether, because did they really actually practice them fully? 
uh, we don't judge them solely on the latter. We also, the principles live on even when their practice of the may have fallen short. Thank you very much for that, Peter. And Johanna? Um, if we go, if we look deeper into Rosa Luxemburg's uh, work and life, and this is a little bit what Eric also was really um, saying, we also see like a lot of contradictions because, of course, we now see, how, for example, as somebody who was very important of the development of socialist feminism. On the other hand, there's this very famous postcard she wrote once to Louise Kautsky, where she is complaining that women started to ride bicycles in Berlin, you know, that she cannot, um, that she cannot understand why are they doing that. So she, she had a very, um, in her personal life, she had also like a, a, a very different side, you know, she was thinking and caring, you know, um, for the working class all the time, and she was teaching. And on the other hand, if you look, for example, in Berlin, on the places which she chose to live, she always uh, lived in the suburbs of Berlin. She tried to avoid, you know, the crowded, growing city, you know, um, and uh, she was always moving, you know, further out and a little and fleeing from some context, but also from from noise and um, and other things. Um, and so sometimes you have an impression if you read her letters, for example, that she had a that she had like a little bit of bourgeois life herself you know if she's writing well today i'm in, in in the mood for champagne or i'm doing this or that so she she was not there that she always had like pollution or the working class and on the other hand and the, this is what what makes it so interesting to work on her i guess is that then when she was imprisoned she was never complaining you know, she was, she just took the situations how they were, you know, she lived like with the very little things, you know, doing this work with plants she found in the backyard of the prisons, you know, describing in her letters the situation. There's a very famous um, and super beautiful letter. You could read it in English also on our um, website um, where she is describing, you know, the, the morning um, in the women's prison here in Berlin in Friedrichshain, how, you know, 500 people under very bad conditions are waking up and she is describing it as a, as a large music play for a large orchestra. So she's, she, was, she had the tendency also always to find something beautiful in the situations she were in. And... Um, and I guess um, she did a little bit the same, even though she was suffering very often under uh, under the uh, love relationships she uh, was having. She always ended them when love ended, and she was very much, um, you know, in her self decision, you know, what to do and how um, to live. And I guess all those um, things, which are um, how she lived her life and how she made her decisions, you know. Um, uh, also, um, of course, we're, we're connected to her writings, but sometimes, so this, this is my impression, when I put, and this is also what Eric said before, when you put some of her writings, you know, some of her political writings, uh, for example, in the accumulation of capital, you just think like, well, you know, it's, it's not that genius or beautiful as you imagine it in the whole time. But then if you, if you look at her life at the same time and under which conditions um, she, was, um, uh, she was writing um, the, uh, those works and um, how her political action, because she was, um, she was very active in, uh, in the parties and in the discussions um, during the First um, World War and she was imprisoned. If you put this whole picture together, you know, that she wrote those books, how she lived her life, that she was imprisoned, that she was still an important figure in the in the in the in the Polish revolution but also in the uh, in the uh, German social democracy and she did so many things at the same time and on the other hand sometimes if you read the letters you have the feeling that you have like a very exhausted vulnerable person but she was very strong at the same time and um, this makes her like a very interesting character because you also see as a as a politician what of course she was um, as well a political activist a revolutionist um, uh, she uh, she was she was that much opening this other 
uh, site as well. So she was not only in a strategic situation all the time. She, this critical criticizing herself, suffering about mistakes she did, losing of friendships, you know, um, describing that that was pretty un, I, you know, nobody did that at this time. Her, like the people she was fighting within German social democracy, for example, they were just old male boys networks who, um, who tried to, you know, get their, get their um, meaning, you know, through the power system of the party. And um, so I guess that's very much interconnected in an interesting way with a lot of tensions and contradictions. Um, yeah, it's a good question. One of the compelling things about Rosa Luxemburg was clearly just sort of her love of life. And so you get that reading her letters. And so she sort of embodied a vision that I think was pretty widespread at the time of socialism as the unleashing of human freedom and creativity. And so everybody could have all of the good things in life. You know, that aspect of sort of collective joy as the goal of socialism uh, was very central. Um, as a goal. And I think maybe insofar as also she was upper class that gave her some ability to live that in the day-to-day -day that maybe her working class comrades didn't have. But if you were to ask like, if you were to ask Luxembourg today, you know, how would you, what, what should people do to resolve the personal political tensions? I think she would be, give a pretty straightforward and um, kind of orthodox answer, which is to say that you're not gonna be able to, for the vast majority of people on this earth get freedom under this system. And you're not gonna be able to create sort of islands of socialism under capitalist social relations. You should treat your comrades and your neighbors and just your personal friends and relations uh, with a sense of comrade, comradeliness and equality. But given the social circumstances which you live under, I'm pretty confident and you know it's clear from her practice and writings that her orientation was not to sort of, uh, that the only sort of mechanism through which you could overcome that tension was in the long-term struggle for socialism. But in the short term, and this is what I think is maybe most interesting, the way to kind of resolve the personal political tension, she would argue, was through organization. That individual liberation, insofar as possible under capitalism, even as stunted as that might be, would come not through individual sort of efforts or even just interpersonal relationships would be in the process of collectively associating and building mass organizations that would allow in particular working class people who didn't don't have the you know education or training or weren't born with levels of a sense of agency it would give them and give the vast majority in every country uh, the space to sort of flourish on an individual and collective level and to me that vision is really compelling still because it's so different from what we experience you know we've in most at least advanced capitalist countries, associational life has really declined. And you know, you're more likely to debate somebody on Twitter or online than you are, you know, in person. And in the absence of this sort of like real rich civil society in which the German party, which we were part of, as well as the Polish party, was just amazing. When you look at the sort of richness of the political culture, if you want to think about it that way, with the songs and the culture and the sporting clubs and the poetry, it was like a whole way of life. And that organizational cultural collective is really what we're missing. It's not the sort of uh, embryo of socialism in, in that sense, uh, because it's still gonna be stunted by uh, all of the social relationships that uh, englobe us. But I do think that it points to a different uh, way for even under capitalism, how to express individual agency and kind of collective liberation. And I, I'll just say anecdotally, the closest I came to feeling that was uh, I was really involved in the Bernie campaign this last year. And when we won, it was like a collective, you know, and we won some of the states, obviously we lost the national election. But when we won Nevada and some of these places, there was a level of collective ecstasy that I had just never felt before because we knew we had all done this together. And you saw anybody in the street with a Bernie pin or that, uh, and you knew that they were your comrade. And that sense of collective uh, effervescence is so lacking in most of our day-to-day -day relationships. I think that's what Luxembourg would point to as far as the sort of short to medium term way to resolve the political uh, and personal. 
Uh, yeah, just to add to what, what others have said, um, I especially agree with Eric's point on, on organization because I think this is one of the key uh, things to, to bear in mind when, when you're struggling against systems that seem so difficult to overcome. It's simply impossible, especially as I was mentioning earlier, individually women are today more able to succeed and, and become CEOs and heads of states and so on, but this does not translate into a wider transformation of the conditions of the masses of women who are at the receiving end of, of all the policies that uh, are reproduced by states and, and capitalism uh, and patriarchy together. I would say that Rosa Luxemburg, of course, uh, others have pointed this out uh, already, this, this very poetic and beautiful way of thinking about life as something that is that needs to be preserved, where people need to be able to flourish and develop and where a different humanity will be able to express itself is very much linked to, on one hand, organization, of course, you need to organize and actually be willing to sacrifice in order to make this happen. And I think this is where organization and also political cultures, as Eric just now mentioned, are very much very, very important because in these very highly individualistic ways in which um, many a movement today operate, it's just so easy to come, um, you know, be, to be confronted with these very small sectarian uh, discussions that actually really, really prevent people from organizing against the bigger systems that are very much organized, of course. But at the same time, I think this is important also to keep in mind is belief, is really hope, is really genuinely believing that people can change. And I think this is something that really comes out in Rosa Luxemburg's um, writings or more personal writings as well. And I think this is something that many revolutionaries of the 20th century and also today's revolutionaries uh, have in common is this genuine belief, unbroken belief that uh, we can change the world. And I think this is not something to be taken for granted because I think many people who would consider themselves to be on the left actually don't really believe that we can change the world. There is a, a kind of um, surrender to, to, to electoral politics. There's a surrender to the state. There's a surrender to the idea that we can only achieve a level, a degree of equality if we just change the law. But again, you cannot, like there's a limit to how much you can expect the same systems of oppression that are responsible for the system that, that is currently oppressing people for, for them to actually bring it. And I think climate change uh, is, is one of the most, uh, you know, important questions in this regard. So I think Rosa Luxemburg really for me, and I think for others also represents this, um, this undefeated belief in like if we struggle if we organize uh, we will be victorious and resistance is basically the, the key to victory and I think this is where you know she's not just a symbol she's also um, a legacy that that continues to this day and uh, individually of course she is a, she's an important person she has so much so many contradictions also in her life but I think this is exactly what makes her so approachable like what which, which, which makes her her, uh, her texts so seems so real because it's not really just theorizing in the abstract it's somebody who really concretely thought about conditions and how to change them and who also lived with these contradictions so again it's it's less important to glorify the individual but more to take lessons from them and to think about them in light of the questions we have today uh, thank you so much for that um yeah i just i thought it was quite an important question to address because it's something that's kind of like spoken about in like either whispers or in like quite um i guess like quite unuseful ways quite often uh but not addressed as like a political question uh we have a question from one of our uh one of the viewers tonight who asks do you think that luxembourg might have backtracked some somewhat from her quote unquote Freedom is always the freedom of dissent to stance if she had lived past World War II and seen the rise of fascism. And the person goes on to say, what I mean is that the quote has a bit of a, we must listen to everyone vibe. And I feel like we've evolved past that now. Um, so should we start the uh, other way around uh, this time, just to mix it up a bit? Um, uh, Eric, do you wanna go first? Sure. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know if I have a, a, a very strong answer to it. I would say my sense is uh, she would still believe what she argued then. Um, and that has to do with 
I think a really deep commitment um, to expanding upon the best of liberal democracy and making it real in a way that uh, really informs a lot of her writings and certainly her critique of early Bolshevism. Um, and that maybe has gotten lost a little bit today where um, the critique of socialists at the time and you know Luxembourg certainly among them, what was not really to dismiss liberalism and sort of bourgeois democracy, but to show its limitations in particular, as long as um, property and the economic system was in the hands of a small elite that you wouldn't actually be able to turn the promise of liberal democracy into a reality. And that really was her core critique. And I think that's been proven right. And, and that is to say that she actually was an extremely fervent believer in like free speech in deliberation and in these processes of um, sort of mass democracy that are premised on um, listening to uh, dissenting voices. That, that doesn't exclude fighting fascists, um, but it's, you know, the center piece for her was that the means to do that is through expanding mass democracy and the, the best way to actually isolate uh, the far right and to defeat fascists is um, to sort of be the best defenders of democracy and to make it real, rather than maybe ceding uh, the terrain around that to bourgeois liberals. Thank you for that, Eric. Uh, Johanna? imagine what she would have thought about some of the developments today. I, I don't think that she would have a backtrack, but, um, and I guess she would, if she would be here today, or if she would have been around, you know, after Second World War, she would have been like, she would have criticizing, you know, everything she would have seen around her. I mean, she really had a lot of energy you know, to criticize people within, <laughs> and she was not, uh, she was not in fear to go into so many conflict situations. And so it was, um, it, it, it would have been very interesting. On the other hand, she would not, um, that was, I was just thinking about listening to Eric, and um, she was not, um, like, by fighting fascism and countering the right, and um, also criticizing social democracy, I mean, which is, uh, like, a very, um, important topic today, again, because um, um, we saw um, how social democracy brought us, opened the doors, you know, for the neoliberal situation uh, we have almost everywhere. Um, she would have been very active in that. Um, but on the other hand, she was not an identity politics person. She is an interesting example for, you know, being a woman do what we already talked about a lot, doing things in her life totally different uh, than everybody around. She, um, she was, um, um, uh, she was uh, limping, you know, and uh, she lived a totally different life. And um, but she never, you know, put that in the center of her argumentations. Um, and so I guess that would have been also a contribution, maybe, to the discussions we have in the left today. Thank you, Johanna and Peter. I think that if Luxembourg, I mean, it's always speculative, but I think that if Luxembourg lived another hundred years and came back today, she'd be even more fervent with that view of uh, the uh, freedom consists in the freedom of those, uh, uh, freedom consists of freedom for those who think differently. Uh, and why do I say that? Not because she was a, a abstract idealist who thought that everybody's views were equally important and not that she didn't think that certain views needed to be suppressed. Uh, it was which it was it was a different kind of thing she was saying back then, let alone what she would say now. An example, 1905 revolution, well, 1906, she ends up in Poland during the revolution. Uh, they need pamphlets to be published by her party press. Uh, they go to the print shop, uh, the work, and then there's some fiasco, I forget all the details that goes on that prevents them from publishing the pamphlet. Uh, and part of it is because of they don't know they, they agree with her politics. She pulls out a pistol. She didn't know how to use it, by the way, but she pulled it out. <laughs> God, thank God she didn't have to use it. God knows where she would have pointed it. Uh, and basically says, you know, you're going to publish this thing or else, right? She wasn't afraid to take 
you know, necessary measures to advance her point of view when it was necessary. She was not a shrinking violet. Rather, what she was saying in 1918 with that critique of the Bolsheviks is that when you shut down freedom of discussion, especially within the left, because that's what they did, right? In other words, when you ban left-wing parties, left-wing publications, you shut down freedom of speech, et cetera, et cetera, oh, what, there's no possible pathway to a transition to socialism given that kind of structure. So she says a decade before that though, a decade before, I mean, she has a piece that she, uh, it's called um, a Criticism in the Workers' Movement, where she says the following. She says, the freedom to speak and publish is, I'm quoting her, one precondition for the attainment of consciousness by the proletariat. The second is that the proletariat not put any restrictions on itself, that it not say we can discuss this, but not that, end quote. In other words, she, Luxembourg's position, and I'm not sure how much this was shared by others of her contemporaries, um, she didn't believe that socialism would actually emerge, this so to speak, analogous to how capitalism emerged out of feudalism, right? So a quasi-automatic process of economic processes unfolding themselves. She thought it was the first form of society socialism that would emerge through the conscious self-activity of the oppressed. If it doesn't occur through that, it's not going to occur. And it hasn't occurred yet, you know, 100 years later, because we haven't gone through that path, okay? Instead, we have these shortcuts of doing it on behalf of the proletariat. So if that's the case, if socialism is the first form of social system that's a product of the self-conscious, self-aware, self-determined, self-developing action of the working class and other oppressed peoples alongside them, then it follows that without the consciousness of themselves that they develop as a class and as a people, as a, a struggling a force of opposition to society, without consciousness of themselves in terms of their power to change society, without consciousness of what is the exact goal they're striving for, you can't get to where you need to go. And so if you are gonna impose limits on what people can read and what people can write and what people can, can say and when they can say it, you're eliminating the basis of developing working class con uh, consciousness. And with that, you're undermining any foundation for a transition to socialism. Now we can say that now, but we look back now, we see a hundred years of failed revolutions, okay? And so, I mean, it's so obvious that she was right, at least from what I see it, that I think that she would come back and she, she would say, I wish I was sharper in my criticism of the anti-democratic tendencies of the left. Thank you very much for that, Peter. Um, I mean, as the last question uh, where, I mean, I know time flies when you're having fun, but we are almost uh, up to 90 minutes. But as last question, I, I wanna ask a slightly related question just because it's so current at the moment, particularly in terms of the US and UK, but of course not limited to. And also, you know, in some ways slightly related to, you know, the freedom of the dissenters, is um, in the UK, there's uh, this proposed bill by the UK government called the Police and uh, Crime Bill, which essentially would criminalize many forms of protest if passed. And there's been um, many uh, protests and demonstrations against this in the last few weeks. And uh, particularly after the murdering of uh, Sarah Everard by a police officer, uh, a Brit uh, in uh, London, uh, many women's movements actually, women's uh, groups were able to really shift the agenda and broaden the agenda of uh, this uh, woman murdered by a police officer to say, actually, we need to oppose giving more powers to police if, well, first and foremost, if police are murdering us, but also, of course, nowhere in the in no actual functioning democracy should police be given so many more powers. Now, also quite quietly um, in the US in the last uh, year or two, I think of course using COVID as an excuse, many states have also passed bills really limiting forms and ways of protest. So um, obviously not necessary to talk about the details of this, but the reason why I think this is important to discuss is one, of course, it kind of carries on from this discussion about the freedom of the dissenters, but also as we see the capitalist state unable to respond to uh, social problems uh, around it, it of course becomes more and more authoritarian and therefore increasing police powers and essentially seems like the response to 
uh, more powers to police and of course increasing um, uh, how, the way people can be imprisoned. So the carceral state is a response to social problems. I want to ask what would be uh, the perspective of Rosa Luxemburg to, on this, but of course not limited to, you know, if in your responses, absolutely doesn't have to just be limited to what would Rosa Luxemburg say about this, but also what you say about this and actually how cru is it crucial that we must be opposing these bills right now, but also based on this opposition, you know, there was some uh, references to kind of like leadership and coalition building in uh, some some people some of the presentations we heard tonight how crucial is it to start building a mass coalition around this not just to determine what we're against but what we're for um and let's uh let's start with you peter i'll tell you Basically, what my, my view of how Luxembourg would see this is, I don't want to speak for her uh, that directly. Um, the demand uh, that was, that's, th there's been campaigns and discussion and work being done, really hard work being done for some 20 years in police defunding slash abolition, prison abolition, police abolition, and defunding, et cetera, in the United States and the UK and elsewhere. But of course, it's only since last summer that this suddenly burst and became a topic of national discussion. Um, and it's a critically important, uh, it's a critically important thing to push for and to raise because it does something that I think um, Luxembourg really was in a way talking about uh, when Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls it non-reformist reforms, right? It, it does address what's going on in reform and revolution and other writings. It's a demand that on one hand is immediate, that is cut the funding for the police in Chicago, we, I'm part of the Chicago defund police campaign and with 75% cut is what have been demanding of the Chicago city budget to transfer those funds out of the police department into other agencies, uh, 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 restorative or transformative and or transformative justice that can uh, better do those jobs that the police are mishandling. Uh, but calling for that kind of demand, defunding police with the ultimate goal of abolition of the entire criminal and justice system is, is both targeting an immediate object of oppression, right? Police abuse, police murders, police repression, increased repression during the pandemic and elsewhere. But at the same time, it's raising a question that's much broader than that about what kind of, what kind of society actually is a human society. Because can you imagine a capitalist society without police and without prisons? And can you even imagine, I mean, where in the 20th century was there any revolution that even raised the question of the abolition of the police and prisons within that revolutionary after the seizure of power. You don't see that. So it, it, implicitly, it's a minimum demand in a certain sense when, when you say, because of course in, in the defunding police campaign, we didn't expect we're gonna get the Chicago City Council to vote to cut the police budget by 75%. We hope that we can get them down by 3% of course, they increased the Chicago police budget this year, even after the protests. But the point is, is that you make those demands, but making those demands galvanizes people and has them, uh, uh, you're doing something concrete to try to do what you can to push against this, uh, this murderous kind of uh, system that we have here, the criminal justice system in America. But at the same time, it raises the entire question of like, how can we care for ourselves without such authoritarian forces? How can we have human relationships that don't require this kind of repressive state apparatus? And so it's the minimum and the maximum that kind of coalesce, right? I mean, this is something you didn't have in the era of Luxembourg. You didn't have, you, you, they were raised on the Air Force program. You have the maximum demands and the minimum demands, and you try to figure out how to get from one to the other. Later on, that was updated with the transitional programs, but this is on a different level. And so I think that these kind of, the fact that, um, these kinds of uh, 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 issues discussed by prison abolitionists and police abolitionists for years have gotten into the, at least into the arena of widespread public discussion it is extremely, extremely important. Now, I can just ask, add one more word to this <laughs> uh, because it gets complicated by so many other things. I think if I had to single out one day in Rosa Luxemburg's life that I most cherish of all perhaps, it's that day when she heard, learned about the Morocco incident in 1911. That is that uh, the German Social Democratic Party was huge and was getting 
going through ups and downs, but it had been considerably strengthened recently. You get elections are coming up. Uh, now there's a conflict between Germany and France over who's going to get control of Morocco. And the party leadership basically pulls the discussion of the mass strike that she was pushing, trying to push forward since 1905, because they were afraid of electoral losses, right? Uh, because um, uh, 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 because of, um, and especially I didn't want uh, to take, a, at the same time, take a strong stand against imperialism, against the uh, intervention in Morocco and the conflict over Morocco. And they didn't want to publish Luxembourg and the mass strike at the same time because they were afraid that that was going to get in the way of their votes in the upcoming election. And Luxembourg said, fooey on your elections. This is more important to take a stand firmly against imperialism. Now, she didn't use the word racism, but she could have, okay? Uh, that's something I really cherish that, yes, we want to build a broad socialist movement, but we want to do so so that it is in sync with the forces that frankly have done more to put American civilization on trial, class relations in the United States have always been mediated by racial determinations. There's no way to effectively combat class domination without a forward movement and the struggle against racism. And so any compromise that would come in on that is something that obviously has to be resisted. And I look back on Luxembourg, I look back on Luxembourg in 1911, the Morocco incident, and I say, you know what, that gives us some direction for the future. Thank you very much for that, Peter. And uh, Dilai, would you like to come up on this? Sure, I think um, I, I agree with what, what Peter was saying. And I think, um, especially if we consider all of these new bills and the, the rising, uh, you know, the increase in police powers and state surveillance and all of these other things, it's, it's really important to, uh, for social movements, I think, or for, people who consider themselves on the radical side of the left, um, on, the, on the revolutionary kind of left perspective to really think very clearly about their relationship to the state. And I think this applies also to the feminist struggle today because um, there can sometimes be this tension between um, what some people sometimes call this carceral feminist uh, approach in which you know it's all about locking up people and just, you know, policing communities, making sure that my violent men, yes, on one hand, uh, women do need to be protected, but is it really the, the state that uh, should be doing that in, if uh, incarceration is uh, so much linked to, to class and race, for example, like if there's an agenda to uh, incarcerate certain people for certain purposes, what are uh, abolitionist perspectives, for example, on, on that front? So there's sometimes this tension that happens, but I think in any case, of course, there are elections as well. There are all kinds of different political fronts that people are uh, engaging with. But I think um, what's really crucial here is to just be clear about how one engages with the state, how one thinks about electoral politics and does not surrender all of politics to that realm and not focus all of one's energy uh, into uh, reforming uh, states, even if it's through these uh, different, you know, more alternative approaches. And I think this is very closely linked to another issue that is very important, I think, uh, for our struggles today. And again, it makes me think about the time in which Rosa Luxemburg was living, is that today we see parallel to the you know, increase of police powers and state powers and so on and rising fascism, authoritarianism in different parts of the world, the revival of right-wing fascist neo-Nazi movements today, we see also a systematic criminalization of social movements. We see that even very unthreatening social movements, um, those we would even call liberal or middle class are, are exposed to this kind of criminalization policy. And what happens is that those who are really posing a threat to the system because they don't want reform, but because they want system change, are those the first ones to be attacked. And so I think this is something that people really need to think hard about. What does it mean for social movements today to be targeted? The Kurdish freedom movement today, for example, um, without a doubt is one of the most organized and one of the most one of the largest social movements in Europe today. It has amazing organizational capacities, but it's also one of the most surveilled, one of the most criminalized movements in Europe today. 
And this is often uh, not really on many people's radar, but I think it's, uh, it says a lot about, sort of about what's happening. The more certain parts of the left get criminalized and the more certain tactics get vilified. And this is something that we see very often when people say no violence, let's be peaceful. It's, it's not because people want to be violent, but it's, there's a problem I think when people really surrender to this idea that there's only one way in which to struggle. And that is by being nice and kind to the police and be working within the state and its apparatus. And I think this is something, these are the contradictions and the conflicts that we see today in social movements. And I think this is why, um, the reason why I think this relates to Rosa Luxemburg is because she, was a radical and she was ultimately betrayed by people who used to work with her and who then basically uh, surrendered their will in some ways uh, to, to fascism. So I think this is why, you know, having this very clear anti-fascist stance is very important and to think about new forms of fascism and how to defend our communities against it. And at the same time, building new coalitions, new alliances to make sure that we rely less and less on the state and its police and all of its uh, uh, transnationally oppressive structures as well. Thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, I'll be quick because um, I agree with what all the comrades said. Um, I'll just say two points. One is, I think Rosa Luxemburg would have said and still right is that socialist movement, if it's going to uh, ever become a mass force and if it's going to be a force for freedom for all, needs to be always committed to defending and expanding democracy. That's really like, like in some ways that's the core idea of socialism. And I think that that's uh, the case, whether it's just protecting our civil liberties today or whether it's the just deeper process of giving the majority of people control over our day-to-day -day lives. Um, that's the expansion of democracy I think she stood for. And that link to that, she would have said that the only agent that can win that um, in the long term and can drive that process forward is the organized working class. And that's across uh, racial divides, it's across international divides, it's across um, all of the different ways that we're hierarchically internally divided and privileged against each other, that the mechanism through which we get freedom is by uniting that vast majority as a class against our class enemies. And that uh, is like a simple point, but I don't think it's lost its relevance. And it's certainly the case for the fight to protect our civil liberties today and the fight, I think, for uh, socialism in the long term. Thank you very much. And Johanna? Well, because I guess everything is um, already said and um, or most of the things, and of course we have to organize against it. I guess what um, just two things came into my mind um, when you ask a question. And the first thing is that um, Rosa Luxemburg was a victim of what you described. So she was murdered by paramilitaries, you know, who got their weapon, weapons, you know, out of the First World War, you know, the situation after the um, uh, after uh, in the revolution in Berlin, you know, was uh, very complicated and chaotic, and this gave the possibility. So she was kind of a, she was killed by this like this military slash police new state oppression. So we could re uh, we could also remember that. So she kind of belongs to um, to to. Um, those um, who were killed um, today, and but and I don't and I guess what would have been important for her today is she always would, would have opened the view. She would have said, "Yeah, well, there there are the fights in the UK and the US, but never forget, you know, what happened also in the last one hundred one and a half years in Greece, for example, which has become the second Hungary under the." conservative government right now with a lot of laws and restrictions, you know, the migrants on the islands, you know, totally defenseless uh, sitting there. Never forget, you know, that it's happening, that the police violence is happening in France already since a long time now under the, uh, uh, under the laws of uh, Macron. And um, so um, she, she would have reminded us that those struggles are taking place everywhere and that um, uh, that we should not just center the fights around us, always connect them. Because she was she was like looking very broad European always and seeing all those different perspectives at the same time. Thank you very much.
I mean, there are so many more questions we could uh, discuss and try and answer, um, particularly um, in some of the uh, topics and questions that have come up in these 90 minutes. But of course, um, this is the end of our event. But thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you to uh, Peter and Johanna and Eric and Dilar Dirik for all the insights and perspectives on Rosa Luxemburg's thought and life, but also in uh, revolutionary perspectives and organizing for today. Um, and of course, thank you very much for tuning in to our event. If you uh, want to become a member of the Left Book Club, please visit leftbookclub.com and subscribe to our newsletter. All the links are in the YouTube live stream. Follow us, uh, Left Book Club, on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. And our next event, which is also a part of our Radical May series, will be uh, titled Anti-Capitalism and Work. And it's a part of our Anti-Capitalism series with Gargi Bhattacharya and the speakers on that will be Vijay Prashad, Dalia Gabriel and Amelia Horgan. And that will be on the 30th of May. So next Thursday at 7 p.m. UK time. Uh, you can register for tickets on our Eventbrite and all the links will be on our social media. So please follow that. And again, thank you very much for joining us on this uh, evening and we hope to see you at the next event. Thank you very much. <laughs>